the subject for our study this morning, as you can see, is who do you worship? And uh, we want to explore and see what the scripture has to say when it comes to the issue of worship, particularly who we worship. We looked a little bit yesterday at how our worship can be affected by our beliefs. We want to look at who it is that we worship, particularly in these last days. I don't think I need to ask for a show of hands as to uh, who believes we're living in the last days. Okay, I think we all more or less believe that. So worship is an issue of vital importance in the last days. We know that uh, because that's the key issue that is brought out in the book of Revelation, the book that deals with the last days. It's uh, the things that are contained in it uh, are a picture of what happens or what's happening in the world, you know, just before the coming of Christ, particularly because that's the closing scenes there, the coming of Christ and how everything is finished. So what do we learn about worship when it comes to the book of Revelation? I want to explore that a little bit today uh, in the context of the last days. The word worship is mentioned in the book of Revelation 24 times. That's uh, roughly approximately once per chapter, if you average it out, just over once uh, per chapter. So it's an issue that's of importance. And like I said, we want to see what scenes and what information of worship uh, or about worship that we can learn from that book. So uh, Revelation chapter 5, we have this beautiful picture, verses 11 to 14. And... Uh, and this is what it says. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Verse 13. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and as such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb forever and ever and the four beasts said amen and the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever a very grand scene of worship here and this worship goes to how many individuals? Verse 13, to uh, the object of worship, uh, not who are worshiping, the object of worship. Verse 13 says, uh, blessing and honor and glory and power be, where are we? Be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. How many is that? Two, right? Him that sits on the throne and the Lamb. Of course, the Lamb that's... Uh, representative of Christ and him that sits on the throne. If you look in the book of Revelation, you'll find that's referring to the Father, to God the Father. So this scene of worship that involves all these heavenly beings and they're giving this honor and glory and praise to the Father and to the Son. And then in verse 14, the four living creatures or the four beasts say, Amen. It's interesting, you know, you usually say Amen at the end of your prayer, right? At the end of our prayer, we say Amen. That's it. There's no one else that is being acknowledged or worshipped outside or besides the Father and the Son. This is how worship looks like in heaven. This is a very important picture here, a very important scene. It gives us a little bit of a glimpse of what a worship scene looks like in heaven, particularly who is being worshipped in heaven. You with me? Now, I think it goes without saying, but I will say it, that our worship on earth should match the worship that takes place in heaven, right? If we hope to be there one day. That's the whole point of the great controversy, is to restore us back into harmony with heaven, with God and with heaven. This is who the beings in heaven worship. So who do you worship? That's the question we want to ask today. We want to explore that uh, a little closer. Why is this taking place? And the, and the other thing <coughs> here, and I'm going to come back to this as well a little later, after this scene of worship there, after they say Amen, and then it says, they fall down and they worship Him that liveth forever and ever. That's the Father. So here is a scene of worship to the Father and the Son, and then they say Amen, and then 
they give glory and worship to the Father. We're going to see what that means, what significance that has uh, for us as well. <laughs> it closes with this worship to the Father. And so these, uh, these beings, these uh, creatures in heaven, they honor both the Father and the Son. And they honor the Son in the same way that they honor the Father. We're going to see that Jesus actually said that. That's a, that's a verse that Jesus actually said. And in so doing, they are actually glorifying the Father himself. That's, that's the scene that we are, we are looking at here. And uh, like I said, we want to find out why. And we want to see what relevance that has for us in the last days. Because, you know, in the book of Revelation, we also have the three angels' messages, right? The first angel's message has to do with worship. And the third angel's message has to do with worship. You either worship God who created heaven and earth and all the sea that in them is and, and that everything that in them is and the opposite is in the third angel if you worship the beast and his image. It's a contest of worship. So it's very important and uh, it's not just a matter of opinion or, or a, ma a side issue when it comes to worship in the last days. This is what the whole contest is about. Who are you going to worship? A correct worship of the true God must include an acknowledgement of his son and his son's position. That's the scene we see, but I want to explore that, like I said, in detail as well. Another scene we see uh, that takes place in heaven, Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. I want to deal with this verse because uh, it's in the book of Revelation and it has to do with worship. It says, and the four beasts, or, or the four living creatures, it's actually a, a better translation. Four beasts gives you a, it gives the wrong picture in a lot of people's minds. But anyway, the four beasts and each had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Why do they say, holy, 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 three times? Well, a lot of people will be quick to tell you, well, that proves that they're worshiping a trinity. They're saying holy, holy, holy three times. Are you familiar with that? We heard, you heard that before? I have a lot of times. I've heard that from theologians, so I'm not saying this is some, some strange idea that some people believe. No, this is theologians. People have studied the scriptures deeply. This is the conclusion some of them come to. Why do they say holy, holy, holy three times? First of all, if you look at the verse, it actually says they don't cease saying holy, holy, holy. So why does it only record three times for us? Is this a, a, an implying that God is a trinity, that they worship a trinity. If you look at the context uh, in that chapter, the person that they are addressing this worship to is the one who is sitting on the throne, only one who is sitting on the throne. You know why they say holy, holy, holy? It's actually very simple. The answer is right there in the verse. It says, Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. God is the God of the past, the God of the present, and the God of the future. That's why they're saying holy, holy, holy. It's a uh, it's a summary of their worship of the majesty and eternity of God. It's not complicated rocket science hints and suggestions about any trinity, okay? It's actually very simple. It's straightforward. It's the Father. It's talking about the Father. Sometimes we get confused. People say, oh, it's to come. Jesus is going to come a second time, so this must be referring to Christ. No, this is a description of God's eternity. He was, He always was, He is, and He is to come. He always will be. That's what this verse is dealing with. And so they're worshiping God the Father. Very clear. And then in other places in the book of Revelation, God the Father is uh, the object of worship for these beings in heaven. Why is that? Because He is the God of not just eternity, but the God that is revealed to us in Scripture as the true God, the true and living God. Uh, here are a few verses just uh, to indicate that. Acts 3.13, Peter is speaking here under inspiration. Notice what he says, The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. According to Peter here, who is the God of the fathers, the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? It is the one who has a son whose name is Jesus. The father of Jesus is the God of the Father is in the God of the Bible, the God of the Scriptures. He is the only true God, as other verses indicate. And uh, what Peter is basically telling them here, you who claim to be worshippers of the true God, you have denied His Son. And God raised His Son 
the one that you betrayed and denied in the presence of Pilate. You see, all these people were familiar with who the God of the fathers was. This wasn't an issue of uh, you know, controversy as to the identity of God back then. It has become now in these last days because the devil has been busy confusing people when it comes to the issue of worship. So the Father is the God of the Bible. He's the God of the Scriptures. Of course, not just of the Old Testament, but of, of the New as well. And we see that in the book of Revelation. Here's another verse that also says the same thing. First Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10. Paul here writing to that church, he says, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Again, the same thing. Turning from idols, from idolatry, from false worship to serve the living and true God. And according to Paul here, the living and true God is the Father, the one who has a son, whose name, of course, is Jesus. So the Father of Jesus Christ. And it's interesting, he's mentioning, as did Peter, he's mentioning Jesus in the same context, but he's making it clear that the true and living God, the God of the fathers, is his Father. God the Father, one individual person, and other scriptures indicate that there is none other but He. So we want to again look at that a little bit because the issue is uh, in in uh, you know has caused confusion today. There are people who are confused when it comes to worship. When you talk to people about well, who do you worship? Who are we meant to worship? Who do we not worship? There is confusion, and by confusion I mean there is a difference of opinion. And so when you have a difference of opinion when it comes to the vital issue. In the last days, that becomes very, very dangerous. It becomes very important for us to know and understand what is the truth of the matter. That's why we want to look at it in detail. So here is the words of Jesus, the faithful and true Redeemer. Here is how he put it in John 4, verse 23, speaking to the woman at the well. He says, But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. According to Jesus, the true worshipers worship the Father. And then it says how they worship Him. So not, not only does it indicate who they worship, but it also tells us how they worship. They worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Would you say that the beings in heaven are true worshipers? Of course, I think that goes without saying. What about God's people in the last days? We need to match heaven. We need to be true worshipers. This is who the true worshipers worship. Their worship does not, is not in conflict or out of harmony with heaven. I think it makes uh, sense if we're going to end up in heaven with the, some of these beings and creatures that we read about in the book of Revelation. That's impossible. Impossible. To end up in the same place if we have different worship as far as who we worship or even how we worship. So the issue is important because I'm, I'm emphasizing this because many times when you share this with people, uh, a lot of people say, well, you know, look, this is a side issue. This is not important. You guys are getting excited about nothing here and, and God and who God is. And look, when we get to heaven, we'll find out. It's very true. When we get to heaven, we'll find out. But what if God has revealed it before we get there to aid us and to make sure that we do get there? He has in the book of Revelation and in the Bible. And so it's important for us to explore these things. Why is the Father the object of worship. There's many reasons. We saw some. He's the God of the past, present, and future. Here's how Paul puts it in this particular verse, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. He says, But to us there is but one God the Father, of whom are all things, and we in Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by Him. According to Paul here, our God is the Father. He doesn't say it's Christ. We're going to come to that. But he says it's the Father. And then he says, he gives this interesting description. He says, of whom are all things. That means the Father is the source of everything that there is. The ultimate source for everything that exists in the entire universe is one individual person, God the Father. That is why He is the supreme object of worship. And I don't mean object as in thing, but He is the one to where our, all our worship is to go, ultimately. That's why even after worshiping the Father and the Son there in that scene we saw in Revelation, at the end, they bow down and they worship the Father. And we're going to see that relationship between Him 
and his son. He's the great source of all. And this is why he created all things. Uh, in the book of Revelation, it also says that, uh, you know, he created all things. And that's why he's worthy to receive worship. He is that great source of all. And Ephesians 4, 6 puts it this way. One God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. That position is occupied by only one person, God the Father. The whole universe has one head, one person. That's God the Father. And uh, this is why he is the one who receives supreme honor, praise, glory, and worship. This is an important foundation to keep in mind, the fact that God is worshipped because He is the source of everything. And it's really a recognition and an acknowledgement that all that we are in our very existence is basically a result of God the Father is doing. It is dependent on Him. It's, it's a recognition that He is the source of our being and everything in the whole universe. That's what it means when we say He is the source of all. What about when it comes to the sun? How does the sun fit into this picture? Because someone might say, well, you know, you're, what you're saying sounds good, but you're leaving the sun, you know, dangerously. He's a little bit too far away from, I'm not too comfortable with, with how you're implying things here. So we're, gonna, we're not going to make any implications. We're going to look at what the scripture says. Here is a ver another verse from Revelation. We'll go back there to the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus speaking, and this is what he says. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. And someone says, see, here is the description of Christ as just like the Father. And so him and the Father, you know, there is really no difference as such when it comes to worship or even who is the source. And uh, they say, see, it says he is, which is, which is, which is to come. He is the Almighty. The Father is also the Almighty. We have two Almighties and so on. Is this what this verse is saying? Simple answer is no. Well, why am I saying that? What Jesus is basically saying here, it's true, he is the Alpha and the Omega, he is the beginning and the ending. And uh, if you look at it in your Bibles, I'm not sure you have your Bibles open, but if you have a red letter Bible, uh, this is what throws a lot of people off. If you, if you have your Bible, you can turn there, it's not hard to find Revelation 1.8. If you have a red, Bible, uh, red letter Bible, and what a red letter Bible is simply where the words of Christ are in red, or printed in red, that is, uh, you'll find that half the verse usually is in red. Is that right? You have your, is, is that right? Half the verse. Half is red and half is black. Just verse 8. Meaning that Christ is speaking. He says, I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. And the red usually stops here. And then the rest is in black. Meaning the rest of the verse Jesus is not saying. Now, uh, how people decided which parts Jesus is saying or not saying, God didn't give us a, a list as to which verses we color in red. In other words, it's the, the publishers or those, the editors, who think, well, this is where Jesus is speaking. Most of the time they get it right. This is one of the places where they got it wrong. Uh, the whole verse should be in red. In other words, Jesus is speaking the whole time. He doesn't stop speaking. It is Jesus who actually says to John, saith the Lord, which is and which is, which is to come, the Almighty. What Jesus is saying, let me rephrase it and see if it makes sense. He's telling John, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, says my Father. Which is, which was, which is to come, the Almighty. In other words, he's telling John at the outset of the book of Revelation, the authority for me being who I am, John, for me being the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, this is what my Father says. This is what the Lord says, who is, which was, which is to come, the Almighty. Can you see that? Okay, you don't have to believe me. I just want to make sure you just see it. Because sometimes we, we, uh, peop verses are read or people read verses only one way and they don't see that there's any other possibility. Uh, in the book of Revelation, if you study that, you'll find uh, the description of which is, which was, which is to come is only applied to God the Father in all the other instances. And this is what Jesus is basically saying. He is quoting what the Father told him. And this is what he's telling John. And so it's not... Uh, it's not that complicated. This is what the Almighty says about His Son. And that's not the only thing that the Almighty says about His Son, that He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. He also says some very interesting things when it comes to worship as well. Here is something else in Hebrews 1.6 where uh, it tells us, And again, when He bringeth in the first begotten into the world, He saith, and let all the angels of God worship Him. Paul's quoting scripture is here. And of course, this is a... Uh, the authority for that, of course, is God the Father. Paul says, Christ is 
to receive worship. And the angels, of course, are heavenly beings. So even the angels in heaven are instructed or commanded to worship the Son. That's who the first begotten is referring to. That's the Son of God. And so it is not uh, wrong to worship the Son. It's not surprising to worship the Son. We want to see why the Son is worshipped. We already saw that He is, in the book of uh, Revelation, worshipped alongside the Father. And He is not worshipped any less than the Father. He is worshipped in the same way, to an equal measure, or as he says in the verse, we're going to come to that as well, he is honored in the same way that the Father is honored. Why is that? Why is it that Christ is the only one who receives worship with the Father and like the Father? And why is it that when he receives worship, the Father himself is glorified? I want to ask a question here that many times comes up when we talk about this subject, and the question is, is Jesus God? Many people, you know, when you hear these discussions or when you share something with someone, say, hold on a minute. Are, are, are you trying to say Jesus is not God? Is Jesus God? And many times it's a test question. And the only options for you are yes or no. And if you say no, you're out. That's it. No more listening to you, right? So is Jesus God? Uh, the answer is yes or no. And the answer is yes and no. Because the word God is used... Uh, sometimes differently in, different, in, in people's minds. And, and the, the, the exact definition for God changes slightly in our minds without every time us defining it. So God comes out, but it doesn't mean the same thing all the time. And I want to explore that just a little bit. But first of all, is Jesus God? Yes, here is the yes part of the question uh, or of the answer. Hebrews 1.8 tells us, But unto the Son he saith, that's the, the Father, quoting the Father, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. God says to the Son, Your throne, O God. The Father Himself refers to His Son with this description, with this title. God. God is not a name. It's, it's a title. It's a, it's a description. And so there is no question about it. Yes, Jesus is God. Now we want to see why this is so. And also is it, what is the no part of the answer. Now, when it says Jesus is God, it does not mean He is the one God of the Bible, the great source of all. We already found out that it's His Father who occupies that position. You see, the word God is used to refer to the God of the Bible, but it's also used to describe the nature of someone. So Jesus is God in that He possesses fully the divine nature. He is deity completely, fully. That is why we're saying yes. But when it comes to asking, is Jesus God, meaning, is he the one God of the Bible? Then the answer is no. It's his father who has that position. Jesus happens to be the son of that one God of the Bible. That's why I said the answer is yes and no. And so sometimes you're not afforded the luxury of qualifying your answer when you have to say yes uh, or no and choose between the two. You see, when it says the Son, uh, uh, when it says to the Son, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever, uh, the next verse says, uh, and I don't have it here on the screen, but it says, therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness. When the Father refers to his Son as God, the very next verse tells us that he has a God. Still, and that's not the only verse. Let's look at it. The God of Jesus Christ. This is biblical, so I want to read the verse before someone thinks. That's a very strange way to talk. Ephesians 1.3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So does Jesus have a God? Yes, in the same way that he has a Father. His Father is his Father and his God. And even when the Father refers to His Son with that title as God, He says, Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness. So what does that mean? Do we have a, a big God and small God? Some people, that's the, they say, look, you're saying Jesus is a little God in that He's a little less. No, He's not a little God. He is the Son of God. He has the very full nature of His Father, but He is not His Father. He does not occupy the position of His Father. He is not the one God of the Bible. Even He is said to have the Father as His 
God. Because the Father is the source of everything and everyone, including the Son, as we shall see. Uh, here's another verse that says the same thing. I'm just quoting a couple of these more in the scriptures. But 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Again, Jesus has God as his God and his Father. Jesus actually said it when he was on the cross, right? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Who was he talking to? The Father. The Father never calls his son, uh, his son my God. The Son is never referred to as the God of the Father. Because it's the Father who is the source in that relationship. And when Jesus says, my God, my God, and when the scripture refers to the Father as the God of Jesus, it's an acknowledgement that the Father is that great source of all including, of course, his son. Uh, when Jesus uh, was resurrected, John 20, 17 is what he says to Mary. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend to my, unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. That's pretty plain, right? So Jesus is fully divine, and yet at the same time, he has a God. His God is our God, that is the Father. Obviously, when Jesus says here, my God and your God, he's referring to one person, one individual person, namely God the Father. This is the God of the Bible. This is the God of creation. This is the God of the universe, according to the highest authority, Jesus Christ himself. You know, if Jesus says, this is my God, that means this is the one that is to be worshipped by everyone. Does that include the Son? Well, when Jesus was on earth, remember when the devil came to tempt him and he says, look, I'll give you all these things if you will bow down and worship me. Remember what Jesus' answer was? Shall serve the Lord God, worship the Lord God, and him only shall thou serve. Who was he referring to when he says the Lord God? He was referring to his God, the Father. That's who the whole creation is to worship. And Christ is the Son of the Father. So that does not make two gods. Some people say, well, hold on, you're saying there's two gods here. If Jesus is God, the Father is God, that's two gods. No, it doesn't, because Jesus is of the Father, as we shall see. It's not two gods, it's one God, the Father, when it comes to who is the true God, who has a son, who has the God nature, just like him. And we're going to explore that a little uh, closer just to clarify, but uh, I want to make sure I mention that as well. <coughs> it means he is fully divine. He's in the category of creator, not creature. Like Paul talks about, you know, worshipping the creature rather than the creator. He's not in the category of creature. He's in the category of creator. It was actually through Christ that God the Father made everything or created everything. That's his divine inheritance. And that's what makes him God. We want to explore that as well. What is it that makes Christ a possessor of this divine nature? Or in other words, what is it that makes him equal to his Father when it comes to this God nature? It's based on something. John 5, 18 tells us, uh, Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. The equality with God is based on the fact that God is his Father. This is a very important, a very foundational scriptural truth. The sonship of Christ and the fatherhood of God, this relationship between the two, is what lays the foundation for the equality of Christ with the Father. Notice he didn't tell the Jews, I am equal with God, did he? He told, him, he told them that God was his Father. But that automatically made him, in their eyes, in their understanding, and correctly so, it made him equal with God. So his equality is based on his sonship, on his relationship with the Father. And uh, other verses tell us that too. In Philippians it says, you know, Jesus thought it not robbery to be equal with God, uh, though he was in the form of God, but he took on the form of a servant. He made himself of no reputation. So there is no question that Christ 
has the divine nature with the Father equally. He doesn't have a, a lower form of it. He doesn't have a lesser measure of it. He has it with the Father equally. But that is based on the relationship he holds with the Father. He inherited all these things because he's the begotten Son. And I want to spend some time looking at this particular word, begotten, because that word gets a lot of attention these days. Uh, but it's part of his inheritance. It's very simple. It's like, you know, when, uh, what was it? Last, no, I, I wasn't here. Sorry, I'm trying to think of, of a time frame. But when we had our, uh, our baby girl, our daughter, uh, she was born a human being, right? Nothing surprising there. That's what happens all the time, every time. Because her parents, me and her mother, my wife, are human. That's what you expect. She inherits the human nature from her parents. That's all of us. That's how we all got it from. This law of inheritance that God put into creation in, in, the, in Genesis says everything will reproduce after its kind. This law of inheritance is a reflection of the relationship that the father and son have. That the son was begotten of the father and he inherited the very nature of his father. And part of that inheritance includes the very life of the father as well. Uh, here is how John puts it, John 5, 26. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the, to the Son to have life in himself. So that's why there is no wonder or surprise why Jesus is called God. He has the very nature, he has the very life of his Father. There is no other way to categorize him, so to speak. You can't refer to him as just an angel or, or, or a human or any other order of beings. He's in the category that the Father alone occupies. He has that nature. And that is why, of course, he is worthy to receive worship. Now, <clears throat> this is how John 1, 1 puts it. And again, this is a much mis uh, misunderstood verse. Uh, John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, referring to Christ, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. If you look it up in the Greek, you'll find that uh, there is a definite article there. Uh, he was with the God. Of course, that's referring to the Father. The Word was with the Father, and the Word was God. There's no definite article there. In other words, it's describing the nature of the Word who was with the Father. It's not saying both were the same person or both were the same God. This is how sometimes people read it. And it's not saying there are two gods. It is simply saying Christ existed in the beginning with the Father, and he had the very same nature of the Father, that is the God nature. I want to explain it this way, maybe it will help uh, make a little bit more sense. Uh, if we were to apply the same principle or the same uh, wording to Adam and Eve, okay? Two humans, right? The first two humans. This is what it would be like, and this helps explain John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the woman, and the woman was with the human, and the woman was human. Is that a true or a false statement? That's very true. Does that make sense? The first time a human is mentioned, it's referring to Adam. The next time it's mentioned, it's referring to Eve and the very nature of Eve, right? This is what it's saying when it comes to Christ in John 1.1. 1 .1. So it's affirming his divinity, but it's not distorting or destroying the relationship that he holds with his Father. And because the Father is the great source of all, including his Son, when we honor the Son, we actually honor the Father and acknowledge Him. John 5, 23, Jesus says that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent Him. We need to honor Him as the Son. And that's why in Philippians as well it tells us at the end when every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's a scene of worship, acknowledging the Lordship of Jesus Christ and then it says, to the glory of God the Father. Why? Because it's the Father who is the source of everything that the Son is. And we saw that very, well, early on in our study, but at the very end there in the book of Revelation. We saw the scene of worship to the Father and the Son, and then they all worshipped the Father. He is the great source of all. And when we recognize and honor His Son as the Son, it's a recognition of the position of the Father as well. You see, the terms Father and Son are not just titles. They're not just, uh, you know, aspects that uh, God took on for the plan of salvation. They actually reflect a reality. 
The father is a real father, the son is a real son. And that's why he is the father, the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You find in the scriptures that only Christ and no one else is worshipped and honored as the father is. Nowhere are we told that anyone else should receive the same honor and worship as the father. Only the son. Why is this so? The answer is simple. It's because he is the only other divine being that exists in the universe. There's no one else. Why is it that he's the only other divine being? Why am I saying that? The Bible makes that clear. When we look at how Christ actually is the Son of God. John 3.16, probably most, the most famous verse in the Bible. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This verse tells us how Christ is the Son of God. Because a lot of people say, oh, yes, we, well, we all believe Christ is the Son of God. It's true, but a lot of people believe that he's in the Son of God in different ways. Some people believe he's the Son of God because he was born in Bethlehem. Some people believe he's the Son of God because there's a title bestowed on him. Some people believe it because that's a decree that God made. There's all kinds of ways that people explain how Christ is the Son of God. How does the Bible explain the Sonship of Christ? That's what matters to us. How has God revealed it? Not how theologians have explained it. And God has revealed it by saying, Christ is his only begotten Son. So first off, does that mean God has any other children in the same way? No, he's the only begotten Son. That's why we're saying there's no one else in the universe who has that same nature with the Father equally. He only had one Son. He didn't have multiple sons, only one. And if the Father is the great source of all, and He's the only divine being that there is, and even His Son inherited His divine nature from the Father, that automatically means there cannot be any other divine beings in the whole universe. There is no other source. Is this verse referring to when Christ was begotten in Bethlehem? This is how some people explain it. And uh, it doesn't. The reason why we know it doesn't because when we look at other verses. Galatians 4.4, 4, for example, says... But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. If you look at other Bible verses, you'll find it actually says, made of a woman, sometimes it's translated as born of a woman. And that's what the meaning is. So who was born of the woman? The son of God. So Christ did not become the son of God when he was born. The one that was sent was God's son, and then he was born of a woman. So his sonship to God preceded his birth in Bethlehem. That's what John 3.16 is talking about. Christ was the begotten of God, the only begotten of God. And that begotten of God was born of a woman. So what does begotten mean? And when was Christ begotten of the Father? This is a very big debate. How does begotten mean? I've had people say, look, you guys, you believe Christ is the begotten Son of God. Your only argument is this word begotten in John 3.16. You've built your whole theology that Christ is really born of God on this one word. That word does not mean what you people are saying. It actually means unique. Right? Have you heard that? <laughs> you, this is probably one of the first things you ever hear. One of the most common positions and arguments that theologians have as to the meaning of the word begotten, oh, it means unique. What does the word mean according to the Bible? How does God explain it? How does Jesus explain it? It's actually very simple. It's very plain. If you look it up in the, in the concordance, it does mean be born. It means begotten. It means what it says. But I'm not going to go into the debate of the Greek and trying to parse all the different sources and, and origins of the word. The, the concept is explained in the Bible, and that will help us understand what John, the author, means in John 3.16. What he had in mind when he said begotten. What's he trying to say? What's the point he's trying to bring across? So what does begotten mean? Notice how Jesus puts it. As recorded by John, of course, John 16, 27. For the Father himself loveth you, Jesus said, because ye have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. I want you to think here carefully a little bit with me as, as we look at this. When it says, Christ, he says, you believed, tells his disciples, you've believed that I came out from God. What does that mean? Okay, if you look up the meaning of the word, it, it means literally to come out from someone. But I, I don't want to get into the Greek because sometimes theologians say, well, you don't speak Greek, I do. So I should tell you what the meaning of the words are. Right? That's, that's very common. But let's look at the meaning. What is, what is it that the disciples believed about Christ? 
Did they simply believe that he was sent by God? That's how some people explain this verse. They say what Jesus is saying here is simply that the disciples accepted that he was sent from God. That's what coming out from God means, that God simply sent him. The disciples actually explain it very, uh, very, very clearly. It wasn't just that he was sent from God. Let's see what they say. John 6, uh, 69. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. So the disciples acknowledge and accept and believe that when Jesus says, I came out from God, that's referring to his sonship, not him being sent. You with me? That explains what begotten means, which is recorded by the same author of the same gospel. He is one of those who believed and was sure that Christ is the Son of God, or the one who came out from God, or the only begotten of God. It's the same thing in different words. We're not going to the Greek, okay? This is English. We're still in the English language. That's what the words actually mean in Greek, but we're just using the scriptures uh, to explain it. That's not the only time. John 1, 49, Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. And how John explains this sonship is saying he's the only begotten, or he came out from God. That's what happens when you are born. You come out of your parent. In our existence as human beings, we come out of our mothers. That's not the case with the father. The father is the one who had a son. He's the begotten of the father. Some people say, well, what you're saying doesn't make sense. Are you saying Jesus had a mother? No, the Bible hasn't revealed that, and it's a little bit... Uh, Ludicrous to even suggest that as if God could not do something except in the only way that we can do it. You with me? It's, it's a limitation on God. It's like, oh, you can't believe that Christ is the begotten of the, of the Father. Where is his mother? There's no mother, so he's not a son. That, that's, that's tragic. God, I, I don't need to tell you that God can do whatever he, he, he can, uh, sorry, whatever he wants without any limitation, okay? So God... Uh, just like you can, maybe this is a good, a good comeback to tell someone who says that. Who was Eve's mother, right? That's a good question to think about. <laughs> so, so God can do things that we don't fully understand. So just because we don't understand something doesn't mean it can't happen, okay? God said he is his son, his only begotten son. This is what the disciples believed, and this is how they understood the meaning of that. John 1, 34. And I saw in bare record that he, that this is the Son of God. This is John the Baptist referring to Christ. All these people were people who believed that Christ came out from God. That means he is his son. Uh, Matthew 14, 33. There's a few. I'll just read those quickly. Then they, were, then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Matthew 16, 16. Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. 1 John 4, 15. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. This is what it means to believe that Christ came out from God. That Christ is the begotten of God. It's to believe that he is the Son. That he literally was born of the Father. And this is, it says here, this is why God dwells in those who believe that. Jesus actually told his disciples, the Father loves you for this reason, because you believe that I came out from him. In other words, you believe that I am really his son, that he is my father. The same thing that the Jews refused to acknowledge and believe, that when Jesus says, I am his son or he is my father, they said he's blaspheming and they wanted to stone him. And we'll see that as well. And so God dwells in those who confess that Jesus is the son. The begotten son. So the meaning of the word begotten is not unique. He's not just unique. And it's true that he is unique. He's the only one who was begotten of the father. That's what makes him unique. But some people, you know, try and redefine the word to deny the sonship altogether. Say, well, he's the unique son. Well, what, is it, what is it that makes him unique? Is that he was begotten. He was born. He's not just a unique someone else. Because the word son is in that verse too. And sometimes people think, oh, begotten is what we focus on. No, there is plenty of evidence. It's not just based on one word. And so, uh, how important is this belief? Let's look at 1 John 5, 5. 1 John 5, 5 says, Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is 
the Son of God. This has to do with our victory. Believing that He's the Son of God, that He came out of God, that He has this divine inheritance. And here is how Jesus explains it as well. Now that we've looked at all these confessions of faith and its importance, this will make more sense. John 8, 42. Jesus saith unto them, said unto them, If God were your father, speaking to the Jews, you would have loved me, or you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. This is talking about the same thing. Saying to the Jews, if you really believe God, if you really, as you claim, that God is your father, you would love me because I am his son. I am the one who proceeded forth and came from him. And again, the same, if you look up the Greek there, to proceed forth means to come out from, or as elsewhere is recorded in John, to be begotten. Otherwise, he's telling the Jews, if you really love God, you would have no problem accepting and loving me because I am his only begotten son. Not only that, I didn't come of myself. He sent me. I am his son, and I'm authorized on my mission to come here by him. That's what he's saying. Two things. It's not just that I was sent. He's basically saying, I'm, just, I'm not just somebody from heaven. I happen to be the only begotten son. That's what you're refusing to acknowledge. That's what this verse means. And this is what helps us understand John 3.16 as well. And this is what the disciples preached about Christ too. Acts 8.37. And Philip said, uh, this is to the eunuch, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. God. This was the belief that was the basis for the, found, uh, for the baptism of this man that day. And Acts 9, 20, Paul, and straight away he preached Christ in the synagogue that he is the Son of God. This is what makes Christ unique. So there's no question that he's unique, but it doesn't stop there. He's unique because he's the only one who is the begotten Son of God. And the reason why the scripture qualifies for us why he is the Son is because we also are called sons of God. Angels are also called sons of God. So to distinguish Christ, to help us appreciate that, look, Christ is in a position that nobody else occupies. He is also the son of God, but he's the son of God in a way that nobody else is. He's the only one who was begotten of the Father. He's the only one who inherited the very nature of the Father. And that's what makes him worthy of worship, just like the Father. Heaven knows all this information. They understand that. That's how they worship. It's us down here who are getting confused about the thing. That's why God has revealed it in His Word. And so, this is what the Scripture reveals. Let's look at, in contrast to that, those who did not accept that Christ came out from God. Because Jesus told His disciples, the Father loves you because you believe that I came out from Him. And they expressed that belief by saying you're the Son of God. Let's notice the contrast, those who did not accept that Christ came out from God. This is how they ex expressed it. John 10, 36 Jesus says, Say of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said I am the Son of God. Those who disbelieved Christ said he is blaspheming when he expressed this truth. They rejected his sonship. They refused to acknowledge that he is the Son of God. Matthew uh, 26, 63. But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, This is at the trial. I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus, of course, says yes, or you have said. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. What's his blasphemy? That he's the Son of God. This is those who refuse to acknowledge his sonship. They classify it as blasphemy. You see, the Jews did not, uh, did not have a problem with the fact that God has a son. What they were refusing was that Jesus Christ is that son. You with me? I want to make sure we understand that, that difference. Because some people say, well, the Jews never, never believed that God has a son. That, that, that's a strange doctrine. No, they did. Here's the high priest who believed that God has a son. His problem was not that God has a son or not. His problem was, is this poor, lowly carpenter from Galilee, is he that son? Unbelievable. That's what he had a problem with. You see the difference? They did not have a problem that Christ, uh, sorry, that there is a son to God or there is a son of God. And we see that in, the, uh, in what Peter said as well. You know, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, the Messiah. The common belief of the 
Jews at the time as expressed by Peter that the Messiah who would come would be none other than the Son of God. And so they looked at Jesus and said, you? No, we don't believe that's you. That's blasphemy. Let's kill him. And they did that. And of course, on the cross, this is how they ridiculed Christ. They said, if you're really the Son of God, come down from the cross. Same thing that the devil had done in the wilderness when he told him, if you're really the Son of God, prove it. The sonship of Christ is an important element, and we're going to look at that a little bit more detail today. But this denial of the Son did not start here on earth when he was you know, in, in Jerusalem or among the Jews. It started all the way back in heaven. I want to read to you this statement from the book This Day with God, page 128. It shows us the source of this opposition. And uh, we're getting close to the end, so we're almost there. Here's what it says. Angels were expelled from heaven because they would not work in harmony with God. They fell from their high estate because they wanted to be exalted. They had come to exalt themselves, and they forgot that their beauty of person and of character came from the Lord Jesus. This fact the fallen angels would obscure, that Christ was the only begotten Son of God, and they came to consider that they were not to consult Christ. Very revealing statement. And... Uh, Unfortunately, this statement didn't make it in the book Evangelism. Man, that would have been a very different story today if that statement was there. Particularly those pages, right? 615 uh, to 617 and so on. It doesn't get quoted as often, but it's a very revealing statement. It tells us that in heaven, Lucifer and his angels had a problem with the fact that Christ was the only begotten of God. The only begotten Son. They had a problem with that. They were denying this. They were trying to obscure it. That's what it means. They're trying to hide it. This is what the problem was. This is an aspect of the great controversy that hardly ever gets any attention and hardly ever gets any mention. Satan in heaven actually rebelled against the authority of the Son. This is why we see on earth he constantly challenged the Sonship of Christ and he led the Jews to deny that Christ was that Son. And it tells us here that this is a fact, right? It's not... A metaphor, it's not a role play, it's not a title, it's not a decree, it's not any of these fancy words that you want to use to try and replace that it's a fact that he is born of God. And that's written in English, okay? We don't need to go to Greek to figure out what this is saying. This is written in English. Now, this is, this is very serious, brothers and sisters. This denial, the root and the source of the denial of the Son of God actually comes from Satan. It is Satan who has a problem with Christ. He was kicked out of heaven over it. That's pretty major stuff. What about today? Do we have a denial of this same fact today? We do. Here's an example. This is a magazine called Adventist World. Maybe you get this magazine. And uh, I'll give you the date in a minute. But here's the article. A question of sonship. And uh, you might have seen, has anyone seen this? Okay, oh, well, a lot of people have seen that. Great. Well, someone sent it to me. That's how I saw it. So I thought to share it with those who haven't seen it. This is an article written by retired director of the BRI, Biblical Research Institute, Angel Rodriguez. And this is what it says. I'm going to quote it. It's, it's online and it's all there. This is a direct quote from it. This is the article online. What does the Bible mean when it refers to Jesus as the Son of God? Quote, Christ is the eternal Son of God. We are dealing with a metaphorical use of the word son. What does metaphorical mean? Not real. Okay, it goes on. Here's, here's another quote from the same article. Metaphorical significance. The son is not the natural, literal son of the father. Adventist world, November 2015. So this is pretty current, right? This is just last year, not even long uh, last year. This magazine... Advent, Adventist World, here is what it says. The International Paper for Seventh-day Adventists. I, I stopped and I had to think about that for a minute. This is the international paper for us as Adventists who believe the Bible. In it, when it comes to the most foundational truth about the Son of God, what we are being told is the Sonship of Christ is only a metaphor. It's not, re it's not literal. It's not natural. So it is unreal. It's make-believe. It's a fable. It's a role-play. It's any of these things. It's a pretend. 
This is tragic, brothers and sisters. Now, this is not to condemn people, but this is to show that there is a problem. And the source of the problem is Satan. A denial of the Sonship of Christ is going to affect our worship, as we shall see in a minute as well. And this is why it's a key, key truth that has been revealed time and again. That's why all these verses we quoted, everybody's saying, Son of God, Son of God. It, it's not just to quote them, you know, for, for a number. It's to show this is something that is recurring. This is important. And it, show, it helps us understand also what the word means. And this is why in the book of Revelation, <coughs> Jesus reminds John of this fact. And he reminds us who will read that book. Revelation 2.18, unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. We found out what that means, what Son of God means. He's the only begotten, and what that means is, he came out from God, who proceeded forth and came from God. It gives him that divine inheritance. Is it possible to deny the sonship of Christ? And still be okay in our worship today. Absolutely impossible. Because what we believe is not just something that is in our head. And we're going to look hopefully at, at what uh, is in the head as well. But it reflects in our worship, in our behavior and in our worship, how we relate to God. When you don't acknowledge that Christ is the begotten Son of God, then what is the reason that He is to be honored in the same way as the Father? If he is not the begotten son, he received nothing from the father. And yet people who believe that he is not the son, they still believe in the divinity of Christ. What that means is simply, you believe he is another God or another source just like the father. He did not receive anything from the father. He is another source like the father. Now, if you're open to that possibility, that opens you up to all kinds of other problems, as we shall explore a little bit as well in a little time we have left. You see, the Sonship of Christ, biblically, when you understand it, when you accept it, it's a safeguard acce against accepting any other God. It's a protective measure. You know God had only one Son. That automatically tells you there can't be any other divine beings, Father and Son, that's it. You know, people go get all, uh, you know, caught up in the Spirit, then we're going to talk about the Spirit very briefly. And, uh, Oh, what spirit? What about the spirit here? Is a divine being like the Father and Son and person and this and that and the other and so on. You know why that problem exists? The foundation to that problem is denying the fact that Christ is the only begotten Son of God. If you believe Christ is the only begotten Son of God, the spirit and the understanding of spirit is going to be so easy to figure out. It will just automatically fit in place, as we shall see. And so, when we deny the Son, we actually deny His divine inheritance. And when we deny His divine inheritance, it means we are denying that the Father is the source of it. We make Christ his, his own original source of this divinity. Multiple sources, more than one source. If there is any other source other than the Father or besides the Father, that's another God. There is no other way to avoid it. It doesn't matter how much you insist they are one or united or agree. That's another source. That's another God. Then the head of the universe is not only one it's two. It's actually three because people usually believe in the Trinity. It's three. But this is what starts the journey to three. It's when you separate or you deny the relationship between the Father and the Son. Does that make sense? You see what we're saying? And so the foundation is right there, the metaphor. Kind of like the approach that Lucifer tried to use because that's what distinguished him and Christ. He says, well, no, he's not the begotten Son. We're all sons of God. So we should all have equal honor. Don't you guys think I should have that honor? That's what Lucifer's idea was, right? I should be worshipped like God. It opens the door. You deny the sonship, the safeguard against all these false ideas. You open the door to only God knows where. The Trinity or tritheism is a very good example of that, that there are three actual sources. Now, when it comes to the Spirit, what about the Spirit? Like I said, the, if, if the sonship of Christ is the safeguard and the safety to that, if you think about it this way, the biblical understanding of the Spirit, whatever it might be, it cannot be another person who is divine like the Father and the Son. Why? Because God only had one Son. If the Father is the only true God, the one divine being of the whole universe, He only had one Son who inherited His divine nature, 
He didn't have any other sons in that way. Then there are no other divine beings. Then whatever the spirit is, it cannot be another divine being like the father and the son. You with me? Done. That's it. There you go. That's the spirit explained. Easy, right? When you understand the son, you understand what everything else is. Let's see what the Bible says briefly, just so we can make sure that is the case. John 4, 24, Jesus speaking. He says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Who's he talking about? The Father. We read the previous verse earlier. God the Father, who is the, who is the one who is worshipped by the true worshippers. God the Father is a spirit. He is a spirit, and he has a spirit. His spirit is a Holy Spirit. It's not someone other than Him. And because Christ is the express image of the Father, that means the same description can be rightly applied to Christ, correct? The Bible tells us that. He's the express image of the Father's person. He's all the brightness of His majesty and glory. And so, does, is the Spirit someone other than the Father or the Son? Galatians 4, 6 tells us, uh, And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, the spirit of his son is not someone other than the son. We all have a spirit, right? If I say the spirit of John or the spirit of Linda, that's not someone else. That's the person themselves. That's that spiritual component of the person. The Bible tells us God is like that. We were made in his image in a small scale. And so this is what happens when you deny the sonship of Christ. You start separate. If you separate between the Father and the Son, that relationship, then of course it makes sense. Why not separate between God and His Spirit? We made his son, his son another God. Make the Spirit another third God. Now you have three. Now you're in harmony with everyone else. No problem. That's what's happened. And it's a tragedy. Because if... Uh, you know, that's the thing. If, uh, if you deny the sonship of Christ, and accept him as a divine being, then what, what should stop you from accepting others in that category? You don't have any defining way to determine who is God. If you're denying that the Father is the only true God, you've accepted the Son, denying that he's begotten of the Father, denying that the sonship, uh, that the divinity of Christ comes from the Father, then what would stop you there? It's very logical to then say, oh, well, maybe there's someone else. And this is how the Spirit has been misunderstood in the Bible. Is the Spirit ever worshipped in the Bible? Never. Is the Spirit ever worshipped in heaven? Do we get any information about that? Never. Why? They know this stuff in heaven. They're not confused about it. They don't believe in the Trinity in heaven. Even Satan doesn't believe in the Trinity, you know that? Satan believes there is one God and he trembles. Now here's a question I want to ask, I want to explain this as well. Is the Spirit a person? A lot of people expend a lot of time and effort and energy trying to prove that the Spirit is a person. In so doing, believing that it automatically proves it's a different person to the Father and the Son. Look, I'm going to say right here, you know, this is being recorded. The Spirit is a person, okay? There's, there's no question about that. Because God is a person and God is a Spirit. So, of course, His Spirit is a person. It's not a different person to him, though. This is where the discussion should be. You know, if, if, you want to, if you want to have my attention, show me from the Bible where the Spirit of God is a different person to him. Don't just try to prove that it's a person. I believe that. And I can say the same goes for everybody who believes the same thing we believe or who's, you know, of the same understanding, that the Spirit is a person. It's the very person of God. Just like your spirit, your spirit is not just an, uh, an essence or, or just a force or just energy. Your spirit is a person. It's, the v it's your very own person. It's, your, it's where your personality, where the real you resides. That's what your spirit is. But good luck trying to prove to me that your spirit is a different person to you. Nobody believes. If you believe that, you might be uh, put in an institution because there's something wrong in your mind, right? You can't function properly in society if you believe that. How is it possible that we believe that about God? So, the Spirit is the very person of God, is the very presence of God. It cannot be anyone else. It cannot be any other divine being. God only had one Son. So, that's what the Sonship saves us from. The picture of worship in the book of Revelation that is contrasted with the worship of the true God and His Son is the worship of the beast and His image. Any worship outside the Father and the Son, brothers and sisters, is 
a deception is error because the father only had one son. I keep saying that because that's important. That's what the Bible brings out. Because the issue, we cannot be mistaken about it in the last days. We can't, we can't uh, you know, take the risk and just be on the safe side when it comes to worship. And, well, let's just do it this way just to be safe. And when we get to heaven, God can clarify these things for us. That's what a lot of people say. But what if he has? And indeed, he has. Now, today, what is worship is this common idea that God is a trinity. And this is how the trinity is defined. There is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons. Three different persons. And this is the definition from our church, okay? So this is not a stranger to us. This is from our fundamental beliefs. This is what is worshipped, or this is who is worshipped. Three persons. A unity of three persons. This is not in the Bible. Worshipping the Father is in the Bible. Worshipping the Son as the only begotten Son is biblical. But this, as we saw earlier, the Son here is not a real Son. He is not a natural and literal Son. It's a metaphor, correct? We just read that earlier. This is how this Son is explained. And the Holy Spirit. We don't see that in the Bible. So what does that mean? I want to explain this a little bit because sometimes people say, well, you, look, you know, this is... Uh, you know, sometimes you'll say, look, this is what Rome believes. And you share this with people and say, no, 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 no. What we believe is different to what Rome believes. This is not the same. I want to explain a little bit. This belief in the Trinity is expressed as God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I think we're all familiar with that. And uh, sometimes it's represented this way. Three persons. They are separate. And they are one in the sense that they are united. And this is what makes them one. And they say, this is the one God. Now, uh, th this is, th there's some major problems here because the word God, God, God. When you say God, God three times, that, that's tritheism. We come to that. When you say God, God three times, that adds up to three gods, okay? It's, it's, not, it's not hard to, to figure that out. Three gods. There's no way that you can have three divine beings and only have one God. This is what tri tritheism teaches, that if the three persons are, each and every one of them, an individual person, an individual being, that is the proper definition for tritheism. Their unity is not what makes a one God. Their unity is simply their unity. And so this is a change of, and oh yeah, and the other, and the other uh, idea as well that's closely related is, is the trinity or the triunity or the triune God. The Trinity and tritheism are not the same, brothers and sisters. I want to make, make sure we understand that. The Trinity teaches that God is three persons who make up one being who is God. It's very philosophical and it's very difficult to understand. Where the person is not a being. That's the Trinity, okay? You don't, don't ask me to explain. I'm just telling you the definitions. The people who wrote it don't understand it. I'm just telling you how they define it. Okay, I'm not sure how they can even define something that they acknowledge they don't understand. But anyway, that's another story. This is the, the classic Trinity belief. Three persons, not three beings. One being, three persons inside this one being. Tritheism is what teaches that there are three divine beings. Three persons who are beings, three individual beings who make up one committee or one unity that is called God. Can you see the difference? Both are bad, okay? It's not one is better than it. Both deny the fundamentals of scriptures that Christ is the only begotten Son of God, and they separate the Spirit from God, making it another person. They're both problematic. And that definition we read from the church sometimes is explained as the Trinity, sometimes it's explained as tritheism. They're variations of the same thing. It's the same difference. It's, it's like you want a different color. Now, we saw the Bible doesn't have this term, God the Son. Well, we didn't see that. It's not there. So you can try and find it. You won't find it. It's actually the Son of God. The Bible doesn't have God the Spirit. It has the Holy uh, Spirit of God. Everything is of God. It affirms that the Father is the source of all. He is the head of the universe. This is why these, this, this is the way it's written in the, in the Scriptures. And so that's why we don't have three gods or two gods in the Scripture. We have one God. We have one source. His Son has the very same nature as His Father. Now, this is what we're told when it comes to worship today. This is from the book, The Trinity, on page 273. And this is a, a, a book from, from Andrews, 
Uh, we're talking to someone actually, and uh, and they, they mentioned that the pastor said to this brother, he believed the truth. The pastor said to the brother, "Look, you should go to Andrews, and the theologians there will sort will sort you out. They, they'll explain the Trinity properly to you." So here it is from Andrews. Here's the theologian. This is what they're telling us when it comes to worship. The oneness in nature and character of the three persons of the Godhead raises a, the very useful question of prayer, praise, and worship. But what about direct prayer to the Holy Spirit? While we have no clear example of or direct command to pray to the Spirit in Scripture, doing so does have in principle some implicit biblical support. It only seems logical that God's people can pray directly to and worship the Holy Spirit. Interesting. What are they saying here? Basically this. We know the Bible doesn't say it, but it makes sense to us. It's logical to us. Now you're taking a great leap here when it comes to worship. This is an issue of worship. So we are recommended here by theologians that we are to worship the Holy Spirit. You know what? why it seems logical? Because there is an idea in the mind that says there are three co-equal, co-eternal persons who make up this one God. So of course, if you worship the Father, you worship the Son, of course it makes sense that you should worship also the Holy Spirit, someone other than the Father and the Son. It might make sense, but that's some very dangerous sense you're using, because God did not say, you worship according to what makes sense to you in the last days. That's very dangerous. You know, it's going to make a lot of sense to people to worship the beast and his image. You realize that? It's going to seem very logical. That's not how you arrive at correct worship. And so this is a very, very dangerous thing. Now this recommendation, some people say, well, look, this doesn't happen. Nobody prays to the Holy Spirit. It does happen. I want to show you an example or two. Let us call upon God. Oh God in three persons, blessed Trinity, how easy it is for us to talk about you in the third person. God is good. So dear God, here we go. You are Holy Father, you are Holy Christ, you are Holy Spirit as we plunge into Holy Scripture. We listen for your voice. Teach us. Dear God, Father, Son, and Spirit, you have emptied your throne. Did you all catch that? Praying to the Trinity, all three, addressing all three. This is worship. This is following the recommendation of the theologians, not the Bible. This is a very dangerous thing, brothers and sisters, when it comes in the last days. You worship someone, anyone, or anything outside the Father and Son. doesn't matter what you might call Him or it. Any worship outside the Father and the Son is not biblical. And it's extremely dangerous. Here's another uh, example as well. When's the last time you prayed, Dear Jesus? Oh, probably today. When's the last time you said, Our Father? Eh, within a day. When's the last time you said, Dear Holy Spirit? I've got a prayer for you today. I know you're the one that's working on this earth right now. I know you're the one in control. I know you're the one bringing power, bringing knowledge, bringing wisdom, bringing comfort, bringing peace. I know you're the one that's right here, interactive with us right now. You are God, God the Spirit. I wanna to talk to you right now because there's something I need to have done right here in my, in my own life, in my own community. I, I need to partner with you on this. When's the last time you said, Dear Holy Spirit, and said a prayer? Let's pray. God, today we, we, we love you and we love Jesus, but uh, we want you to listen into a conversation we're gonna have today because actually uh, we wanna talk to the Holy Spirit. Dear Holy Spirit, we just, first of all, want to apologize for ignoring you so much. I, I, know, I know it frustrates you at times that uh, we act as if we're all alone and that Jesus and God the Father are way up in heaven and they're so distant, but we know that you're here. We know that you came and we know that you were sent by God the Father and God the Son and that you have come to bring us, bring us joy and peace and comfort and truth. I just pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you'll fill each of our hearts, make us spiritual right now. And I just pray this all in your precious name of Jesus. Amen. This is very, very tragic, brothers and sisters. Now again, I'm not showing this to condemn any particular individual. I'm just showing this to reveal the presence of a very serious problem in our midst. These are pastors, these are theologians, these are spiritual leaders who are 
recommending that we worship outside the instruction of the scriptures and following this recommendation by their very own example. It's quite dangerous. You know, it says, look, we should pray to the Holy Spirit. And then at the close of the meeting, he actually does that. And it, it, does, it, it sounds wrong, doesn't it? Sounds here's someone talking, not to the father, not to son. It's like father, son. Okay, just go to the side for a little bit. Here, we're talking to someone else. You know how people arrive at that? Denying the fact that Christ is the only begotten Son of God. That's what opens the door to this. This is the logical conclusion of denying the sonship of Christ, guaranteed. The source of that denial is not these poor people. Sometimes, it's actually the devil himself. Some of these poor brethren are actually deceived into believing that this is the truth. That's why we're sharing what we're sharing. Now, someone might say, well, I believe in the Trinity, but I don't do that. I don't worship the Holy Spirit. I don't pray to the Holy Spirit like that. That's an extreme example. So I'm safe. I just worship the Father and the Son. That's a problem. If you believe in the Holy Spirit, you sh uh, sorry, if you believe in the Trinity, why don't you pray to the Holy Spirit? You should, because they're all three co-equal say, well, the Bible doesn't tell me to do that, so I don't. That sounds very, very prudent and commendable. And therefore, people s think that they're not worshiping the Holy Spirit if they don't engage in this. I want to address this as well. In our mind, in the place that we have reserved in our mind for God, where God sits, uh, metaphorically, obviously, okay? I'm just using that as an illustration. In the place, in the inner recess of our mind, the place we reserve for God, if you believe in the Trinity, you have three slots for God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That is worship. You realize that? You don't have to pray directly to the Holy Spirit. You don't have to say, Holy Spirit, I'm praying to you now to worship the Holy Spirit. When in your mind you hold Him in the same place as the Father and the Son, every thing that happens in worship, whether it be singing, whether it be going to church, whether it be offering, everything that you do for God, your concept of God is three. That is worship. You with me? So it's not like you're, you're safer. It's not like even, you know, some of the songs, some people don't sing cer uh, certain songs because, oh, this is a Trinitarian song, but, or they, they're not comfortable with, with worship to the Holy Spirit. It's just, you know, something tells them it's wrong, but they still believe in a trinity. Worship is here. It's not just when you actually pray. So I want to make sure we understand that the issue of worship is a battle of the mind, not just what do you do when you go to church and, and who you pray to. It's, it's not so shallow, brothers and sisters. Who do we hold in our mind, in our heart as God? Who holds the place of God in our affection, in our mind? Jesus says we are to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, right? Who is the one who occupies that place in our mind? Is it the Father and His only begotten Son? One God and His Son, not two gods, like we clarified. Or is it three? A unity of three co-equal, co-eternal persons. The Trinity. This is where the challenge is. And so, I want to leave you with this thought and this challenge. Who do you worship? We're not, we're not going to be in the last days soon. It's here already. We're in it. Who do you worship? I want to remind you of what I said at the very beginning. If we want to make it through the last days and end up in heaven, our worship needs to match the worship that takes place in heaven as far as who is worshipped. The book of Revelation makes clear who is worshipped in heaven. Let us be found in harmony with heaven, brothers and sisters. Not in harmony with the other churches in this world. Because honestly, this is, this is not the standard of finding out what's true. Sadly, this is what we've fallen for. Let's be in harmony with everyone else in the world. Everybody worships the Trinity. Let's be in harmony. We don't want to be called a cult. We don't want to be called a sect, and so on and so forth. What has resulted is it's put us out of harmony with heaven. And we're in the last days. So this is my challenge. This is my appeal. I pray you'll take it to heart. Let's close with a word of prayer. So if you could kneel with me, that would be great. <laughs>